so leading up to this week, um, came up to me and he said, hey, uh, May 5th, I'm, we're going to be taking off. Would you, would, you, uh, would you preach that day? And I said, yes, I, I would. And each time I've been, I, I've been given the, the privilege and the honor of, of, of preaching, um, he's allowed me. He said, you know what? Go ahead and, and depart from the series that we're on. Um, we're on a series right now in First Peter. And he says, just pray about whatever the Lord lays on your heart to talk about. And it's something I really enjoy doing. I'd love the process of praying about that, of about, you know, finding out, well, God, what do you want me to talk about? So after a brief time of praying, it was pretty quick, um, God really downloaded something onto my heart that he wanted me to talk about. And, and it wanted, he wanted me to start out by talking about, about my journey here at Foundations Church and about the journey that my family and I have, have, has been on. So as long as I can remember, um, there's been um, a foundation, no, no pun intended, there's been a root, there's been a core of something that has been in my life and on, on my heart um, in ministry. I retired from the Coast Guard in 2020, and immediately I, I transitioned. This was right at the, the beginning of, of COVID. I transitioned immediately on staff, um, however many years before that, in September of 2012, is when I felt the Lord call me into ministry. We were living down south at the time, and, and I, I've shared it before. I remember the time, I remember like it was yesterday exactly where I was and what I was doing, and I was driving home from work, and I felt the Lord say, I, I, am, I want you to go into vocational ministry. And it would be a few more years until I would complete I would finish my career in the Coast Guard. I felt God, you know, telling me, um, you know, don't, don't get out of the Coast Guard. I actually, funny story, I actually tried getting out of the Coast Guard three times. Um, and, and God just kept on, he closed three doors in me. He says, no, I want, you to, I want you to finish your career in the Coast Guard. But even starting then, and, and even if I think about it before that, like I said, there's been a kind of a, a, a root a core of, of, of ministry for me. It's a constant theme that has really carried me through all these years and, and in today, into today, and it's going to carry me into the future. And that root is, is the, the act or the, uh, the, the posture of worship or how I worship. And there's one area of worship specifically that is impacted me the most over the years that I really want to focus on. But before we get to that, I want to get a little bit more context of why I feel God has really put this message on my heart. So I want to start out, um, as, as some of you know, not, every, not everybody knows, um, I've been on staff here for four years. Um, I'm the youth pastor here at the church. I've done uh, been the kind of director of, of operations as it would be uh, since I was hired. And um, in, in about three or four weeks, um, I'm going to be transitioning off staff. And my family and I are going to be moving down to Savannah, Georgia. And I, I want to say this. I, I love Foundations Church. I've, I've loved working here. Vocational ministry is, has been what God has really put on my heart. And it is bittersweet to leave. We're excited. You know, somebody will, will come up and how, how are you feeling about this? And I'll say, I, I'll be honest, we are excited. We're really excited because what we're doing is we're following what God has asked us to do. Now, there's one area that I'm, I'm most excited about, honestly, and it's as the youth pastor, I, 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 I can say this, I am so excited to see what God is going to do in our youth group. A couple months ago in February, um, we hired, we brought on staff, uh, Alex Henderson. He's uh, Samantha's husband. Samantha's our children's director. If you have kids, you, you've dropped them off. Um, Alex is that guy. He's like eight foot, six inches tall, and he's back there. And he's, he's not scary. He's really, really nice. But Alex has been brought on um, to be our youth, our youth leader for this next season of life. And I can, I'm so excited to see what he is going to do. 
And so I would just ask you to pray for him, pray for our students, pray for the, the parents of students that, that, Ale- that God would just use Alex. So a couple, a couple months ago, this, this transition um, in my life and in my family's life started at the end of last year. So it was, it was about June. We went down to Georgia to visit some family. We have family down there. And it was, it was then that God started a process in our hearts and in our spirits about asking this question about what would it look like to move back down to Savannah. Both my, my in-laws are down there. Um, my dad is, is going to be moving up to the area. And this is just a time that it's going to really benefit us to be closer to our family. It's going to be it's going to be beneficial for my dad. My dad uh, has been a widower since 2008. My mom passed away of cancer. And, and, and like I said, just to be closer to my dad in this season is going to be something that, that we see as a tremendous benefit. So June last year, the Lord really laid it on. And it was actually my daughter and I's hearts at first that he really opened this conversation up with. And my wife would soon, uh, the Lord would soon be talking to her about this transition, even even our son, my 11-year-old son, who we actually, the truth is we, we kept this from him. I don't know if you know an 11-year-old or not, but sometimes they can't keep a secret. And he, he did a great job when we told him. But even for, for months, we didn't tell him. And, and God was actually working on his heart at the exact same time. He would come up to me. And I remember this one time we were, we were driving to school and he asked me, he goes, Dad, what would it look like if we moved back to Georgia? And I'm like, hold on one second. I like grab my phone out, and I'm, he doesn't even know this, and he's sitting in the back. And I'm like recording him, like, what do you mean, son? What does this mean, what would it look like? And, and he just, in, in such an amazing way, he just really just opened up his heart. And he's like, I just, what would it look like if we, if we prayed as a family to move back to Georgia? And even then, God was working on his heart. We prayed for three months straight. And it was amazing, because confirmation after confirmation, the Lord really just opened up doors for us. Doors that we would have never in a million years would have ever thought would open. I didn't have a job I was going to. I, I had no, really nothing. It was really, it was a step in, in faith. And then uh, it, later on in the, towards the winter time, uh, we just, we made the decision and, and we said, you know what, this is this is exactly what God is going to do. But it was the same prayer over and over again. You know, we see this in the Bible with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. A couple, you know, with, within a few moments of, of him being crucified, he, he goes to the garden and by himself he, he prays a prayer. And then he prays it a second time. And then he prays it a third time. Matthew 26, 44 says he went away again and he prayed the same thing. Don't miss, listen, don't miss when God is asking you to devote something to prayer. He would speak to us through those prayers. He would speak to us through wise counsel of people that we confided in and spoke to about, excuse me, whether it was here or or whether it was down there. Like I said, he was opening doors. And as I look back on this entire time over the last season, since God has begun, there's been, a again, that same underlying theme and that theme has carried us from the beginning of my ministry. It carried me up through this, this, this possible transition at the time, which turned into a, to an actual transition for us. And, and I know it's going to carry us on into the future. And that theme, that underlying root is worship. It's worship. So we're going to talk about worship today, like I said. In, in, in your bulletin, we've added a few questions that you can, can kind of fill out. This is more of a reflection for you. It's not so much uh, notes about my sermon, but it's a time for you to open up your heart and to really just ask God, what is worship to you? In what areas of my life could I grow in worship? And in what ways is God calling me to expand in worshiping him? And here in a little bit, we're, we're going to share communion together. And, and what I want to do is I want this to be a time that you really open up your heart to the Lord. And maybe you need to ask the Lord some questions about worship, about how you worship him, and about what worship looks like to him, or to you to be worshiping him. So let's pray together as we begin. I need to ask the Lord to really use me in this time, to to really speak through me uh, what he's really 
put on my heart. So Lord, we just want to humbly come before you. And we, Lord, we want to thank you. Lord, we worship you and you alone. It's a privilege to worship you. We ask at this time together that you would open up our hearts and that you would open up our minds. You would speak to our spirits, Lord, about ways to worship you. Lord, we love you and we give you thanks in this time. And everybody said, amen. amen. So like I said, there's one area of worship that the Lord really opened up my heart to. But before we get there, I, I want to ask this question. It's, it's, a, it's a question that I was continually asking myself. It's, it's what is worship? What is worship? Many definitions, and, and you might have your own definition of exactly what worship is. This is, this is what I wrote down. I want, you to, I want you to listen. Worship, at its core, is to bow before someone, and at the same time, you're lifting them up. Worship is to bow before somebody. It could be a, in a very physical way. You're, 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 laying, uh, you're laying your hands down. You're bowing before somebody. And at the same time, you're lifting them up. Now, notice one thing. I, I didn't say you're lifting God up. You're bowing down before God. Because here's the thing. Listen. There is biblical worship. And that is biblical worship. When we talk about biblical worship, and we're going to, but I don't want to miss this. There are ways that you can worship other things. You can worship the wrong thing. You can worship the wrong thing. I'm going to touch on that here in a little bit. But when at its core, biblical worship is, lift, is bowing before God. And at the same time, you are lifting him up. Now, if you're anything like me, the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of worship, you think of singing. And that is worship. Worship is singing. You are lifting God up. You are bowing down before him. Mallory and the worship team so amazingly led us in worship songs. I love worship music. Psalm 66, 4 says, The whole earth will worship you and sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. That's what these worship songs are doing. When Mallory leads us in worship, this is not a, this is not a, a band up here playing songs for, the, for us to just enjoy as a form of entertainment. This is a collective time that we as a congregation, as believers in God, can come together and we can bow before him, we can give him these songs, and we can lift his name up. Isaiah 12, 5 says this, Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout the earth. As we were singing, I, I, I was just kind of looked around and I watched the, the posture of people's worship. And your posture of worship might look different than the person next to you. I know for me personally, I love playing music. I love playing guitar and drums and, and worship music is something. But honestly, when I'm sitting there, I'm, I might not have my hands raised. For me, the song, I, I love singing it in my heart. And, and that's my posture of worship. And, and your posture of worship might look a little different than mine. And that's okay. That's okay. Another form of worship is giving. Giving is a form of worship to God. So when we, when we come before him with a tithe, when we come before God with our tithes or our offerings, we're telling him, we're telling God that what you have given me is sufficient and the act of worship, we are returning to him. I like how Dave Ramsey says it. We're not giving God a tithe. We're actually returning it to him because it was never ours to begin with. And in this act of worship, what we're doing is we're taking the first fruits. Proverbs says we take the first fruits. We take it off the top. And we give it back to him. It's not from our leftovers. It's, it's not, you know, after the bills are paid and the mortgage are paid and the, paid and the groceries are in the refrigerator. And then we say, okay, now I can give God a little bit. What we're doing is we're giving him the first. And we are saying that, God, I want to worship you through giving, through returning to you what you have already given to me. When you break down worship in the Bible, there's, What's interesting is if you do kind of a word study, there, there's so many words that the Bible, the original language, the Greek and the Hebrew, use in the Bible. And in English, we translate these all to worship. I wanted to go over a few of them. It's, it's really interesting. In a, in a book that Chris Tomlin wrote, uh, Holy Roar, he really breaks down what each of these words mean as you're reading through the Bible. Yada is one of them. It means to revere or worship with extended hands. 
to revere or worship with extended hands, to hold out the hands. It also means in the Old Testament to throw a stone or an arrow. I don't know who he, what he was doing, but listen, it's worship. Halal, to boast, to rave, to shine, to celebrate. I like this. To be clamorously foolish. That is a form of worship. Zamar is an extension of hands, of thanksgiving, a confession, a sacrifice of praise. This could be when we're giving, when we're giving of our, when we're giving of what God has given us, when we're returning it to Him. Barak is to kneel, to bless God, an act of adoration, to praise, to salute, to thank. One of the most beautiful things is when you see people laying down on the ground with their hands extended in the form of praise, of worship to Him. And they're just laying down, they're they're just face down. And it's it's almost a, it's like a physical act to say, Lord, you are above me. And Lord, I am am low. Talal is a, a, a laudation, a hymn, a song of praise, a new song, or it could be a spontaneous song. And there's, there's another word that I want to land on today, and, and we're, we're getting there, I promise. I, know, I keep on saying, we're going to get there, we're going to get there, we're, we're getting there now. And this last word is avodah. It's the word avodah. In the Hebrew, the, 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 there's, a, there's a group of words, and it's avad or avodah. It's found in the Old Testament three different ways. Three different ways. I'm going to read them off here. First, this word can be translated as worship. When God calls Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, God gives Moses this promise. He says this, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Avodah is is the word worship. Second, it is often translated as service, where one submits him or herself to the allegiance of another, whether a slave to a master, a son to the father, a son to his father, or a subject to a king. So Abodah, you can translate it as worship, as service. And the last translation of Abodah is translated as work. It's translated as work. Exodus 34, 21 explains this. God gives further clarity in the fourth commandment regarding the Sabbath, where he says, you shall work, labor, Abodah, for six days, and on the seventh day you shall rest. Now, folks, this is where I want to land today. This is where I feel the Lord has brought me, and this is where I feel my heart is really bent towards worship. Worshiping in song, I love it. Worshiping through giving. There's so many ways we can worship through reading the scriptures. We can worship through giving. We can worship through praying, Lord. But this is where I really feel my heart has gone, is worshiping through serving, through work. And both of those acts, serving, work, we can look at this two ways. We can look at it as So I'm going to use the word serving. Serving others. Abodah, serving others or serving in the local church. Serving others or serving in the local church. And both of those acts, serving and serving in the local, serving others and serving in the local church is, listen, is serving God. And serving God, serving God is a form of, of worshiping God. Serving God is a form of worshiping God. When we serve God, we are in the act, avodah, of worship. The Bible teaches us this in the, when, when we're talking about work, all the way in the very beginning in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, it says, Now the Lord has planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put a man whom he had formed, The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there was the uh, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And skip down to verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man, Adam, and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it, avodah, to work it and to take care of it. This principle of of worshiping through service, through work, it's a biblical principle. First, we're going to talk about serving others. We're going to talk about serving others. Romans 12 and verse 10 says this, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, 
but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Verse 13 says this, share with the, peop- with the Lord's people who are needy. Practice hospitality. A few months ago, the youth started a, a new service project, and we began going up to Brookdale Senior Living uh, every third Saturday of the month. And this was in kind of conjunction with, with a, uh, a series that we started doing called Faith in Action. And what we really wanted to do is we wanted to open up the students to what it would look like, what would it look like to, to not only just say what we believe and to read the scriptures, but actually act them out. We read things like in the passages that we just read, be devoted to one another, honor one another above yourselves, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. And listen, how many, I'm going to speak to myself here, how many of us are actually doing that? And I cannot say that I was at the head of the line when it comes to sharing with others, practicing hospitality. And listen, I know people in this church sitting right here, they're maybe sitting right next to you, maybe it is you, who excel in the act of hospitality. They are that person that just wants to give. And let me tell you, I want to be around those people. I want to glean from them. I want, I want it to rub off on me because these people have the act of hospitality. I want that gift. And when we practice hospitality in the name of Jesus, we are worshiping him. We are. We are worshiping him. When you take the time to go to Brookdale and you, you sit with a group of the residents there and you sing some, some, I'm talking old hymns. Somebody knows what I'm talking about here. We were planning it out. We were going to bring the guitar and, and uh, we had some students that play the piano and Amy plays the viola. And what we were going to do is we were, we were planning out. We're like, let's bring some, some modern day worship hymns, or modern day worship songs. And so we, we printed them off on the computer and then we printed a couple hymns also, and we're like, well, you know, we'll tuck those on the side or something. And when we got there, let me tell you something. They loved those old hymns. Not a single student knew what we were singing, but let me tell you something. They were worshiping through those old hymns. And even though our students maybe didn't know the songs, maybe they didn't even know them. Guess what they were doing? They were worshiping because they were serving, sitting with the residents there talking to them, playing games with them, enjoying donuts with them. You can eat donuts in worship. And it was an amazing time that we had there. What else does it look like to serve others, to worship God through serving others? Maybe it looks like going over your neighbor's house and the wife has a husband who just deployed and she has four kids, three or four kids at home. And she's at her wit's end, and you just push the lawnmower over there. And you go over there and you just mow the lawn because you know it needs to be done. And you're not doing it so you can take a selfie and post it on Facebook and see how many likes that you can get. And you're not doing it to knock on the door and say, hey, I just want you to know what I did. You're doing it because you want to worship God, worshiping through serving others. I'm sorry, serving others is worship. Sometimes it's about inconveniencing yourself for others. So where do we find this in the Bible? We find it from Jesus. Jesus came to serve. Jesus served other people. One of my favorite stories about Jesus is in John chapter 13. It says this, starting in verse 1. It says, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, when it was supper, the devil had already put into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. Verse 4. 
So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel tied around him. This is a story of Jesus humbling himself and washing his disciples' feet. Now, this story, we, there's so much to unpack here, and, and, and we're not going to do that right now. Theologically, historically, if you think about it back then, they didn't have paved roads. They didn't have shoes like we have. And the disciples, whoever entered the home, their feet, they were filthy from the dirt and from the animal waste and everything that they had just walked through. And usually this, this task was reserved for the lowest in the house, the servant or the slave, to wash the feet of those that were entering the home. And what Jesus did is he humbled himself and he, in an act of worship, washed the feet. Now let's listen. Does the recipient of our act of service receive something? Yes, they do. I mean, the disciples' feet got cleaned. You sit with a group of elderly at Brookdale, they receive something because they love when our students come and just sit with them and sing with them and, and, do, and, and play a game with them. They are a recipient of that. The mom who you mowed the lawn, she doesn't have to do it now. She receives a blessing from that. But listen, the worship goes to God. The worship is for God. That's not for the recipient. Serving others, when you serve others in the name of Jesus, you are worshiping. Avodah, you're worshiping through service. So let's, what it, let's look at what it looks like to serve in the local church. And if, if Foundation Church is your home, then, then amen, and, and maybe this is for you. If Foundation Church is, is not your home and you're, you're, maybe you're visiting or maybe you're just trying to find a church, just, you know, just, just, just listen. So this is, we're going to start out in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. It says this, verse 10, 1 Peter 4, 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Serving the local church can be, if done for God, a form of worship to God. I say can be because I'm going to speak on that here in a few moments. But let's look at ways that we can serve the church. Here at Foundations Church, we have so many ways that we can serve. Set up to tear down. The tech area, hospitality, the greeting team, the kids team. There's times throughout the week that we can serve. It doesn't have to be just on a Sunday. We have a, we have a, a, um, a picnic coming up in two weeks serving through making food and, and bringing food in for people. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's you know somebody who is uh, maybe in the hospital and you know that you can have a meal train and you can serve in the local church by making food or ordering, a, 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 ordering some food for them to be delivered. There are so many ways that you can serve in the local church. I want to be very clear about something here. This is, I, I want to I I say this, because this is how I think when I just heard myself say what I just said. This is not a guilt you into serving message. This is not a guilt you into serving message. And the reason that this is not a guilt you into serving message is because I cannot and I will not guilt you into worshiping. I, will, I won't do it. This is not an I need you to serve message. Just as much as I can't guilt you into worshiping God through singing. I can't guilt somebody into worshiping God through praying or worshiping God through reading. I, I, I won't do it and I can't do it. Does this happen in the church? Yes, it does. I, I've been around the church long enough I've spent enough time in, in, in the church context where I understand 
but this is not what I'm saying here. And I think this is so important that we understand the difference. And here's the difference. Here's the difference. The fact is this. Here at Foundations Church, we do need help. We need help in certain areas of serving. We need people to come in at 6.30 in the morning to set up chairs. But why do we need help? So when that husband or that dad who's worked all week and he's had the worst week of his entire life at the job, he can come in here with his family and sit in the chair that you set up and he can worship. And his, mom, his, his son or his daughter can look up at him as in a fatherly and as a, as, a, as a biblical example to what it looks like to worship. We need people to stick around after the service and to, to tear down everything and to to put the school back together. But why do we need that? We need it because we want to honor the county. We want to honor Magruder Elementary. And we, as as Foundations Church, want to leave this place better than how we found it. And tomorrow morning, there's going to be kids from the community coming in here to eat their lunch. And and our prayer is that the Holy Spirit would linger in here. The presence of God would be in here. And they would feel the presence of God and they would be able to learn in an environment that we were able to put back better than we found it. We need people in the kids area. We need people to hold babies, to change diapers, to teach the first graders, the second graders, the third graders. But why? Why do we need that? So maybe, just maybe, that, that, that mother who has the deployed husband is going to come to church and she can drop her kids off in the kids' area and albeit for maybe an hour and a half, she can come in here and she can sit in a row with somebody else and she can worship God in a way that her heart is bent towards worship. And she can have that time. We need people to be at the front door and opening the door and welcoming people and handing a bulletin and organizing coffee cups and filling up coffee creamer. But why do we need that? Statistically speaking, and this statistic is pre-COVID and I don't think it's changed, a new person coming into a church will decide within the first 10 or 12 minutes of whether they want to make that particular church their home church. The first 10 or 12 minutes. Who have they not seen yet? They haven't seen the pastor. They haven't seen the worship team. They haven't listened to the music. What they have seen is they have seen the person opening the door for them. They've seen the person that is holding the coffee cup for them and saying, here, you're welcome here. Have a cup of coffee. They're seeing the person that is holding a bulletin and handing a bulletin to them. And when that is done through the act of worship, that is contagious and you cannot avoid that. When you see that person, you are going to know that they are worshiping. We need people to be on security to keep our kids safe. We need people to run a soundboard. We need people to play instruments. During the week, we need youth leaders. Club 45, we need people to be doing this, but we want people to do it in an act of worship. Listen to me, I want to be very careful. We cannot miss this. Just because we need it doesn't mean you're going to be the one to do it. Just because we need it doesn't mean that, we, that you are going to be the one to do it. Like I said, this is not a message to just guilt you. And you might not be the person to hold babies. You might not be the person to set up chairs. You might not be the person to greet people at the door. I, I would want nothing more than for me to be the person up here singing. But you don't want me up here. I, I cannot Sing, and I, I promise you, we won't need to have anybody set up any chairs next week if I were singing because nobody else would come back. I, it, I'm saying that in a funny way, but I'm, I'm being serious. This might not be the job for you. But what I want you to do is when we view avodah, when we view service, when we view work as a form of worship, it changes our perspective. I promise you something. I promise you right now, there is no sign-up sheets in the back. I am not about to put a QR code on the screen that says, oop, oop, tricked you. Guess what? Now you can serve. Now you can sign up. That's not what this is about. No one's going to catch you on the way out. No one's going to be like, oh, hey, by the way, you feeling that yet? You feeling the prompting yet? Like, no, no. None of that is going to happen because here it is. This is not a message about what we need from you. This is a message instead about what we want for you. 
This is not a message about what we need from you. This is a message about what we want for you. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. And as they're coming up, um, I, I said here a couple moments ago that we were going to talk about the, the opposite of, of biblical worship and about, about how things can be done. And I wanted to just share a brief story, um, just a personal story about serving with the wrong motive. Like I said, September of 2012, I, was, I felt called to ministry. The, the specific church that we were at, this story is by no fault of any church. It is by no fault of a pastor. It is by no fault of a person. It is by no fault of a message that was said this is all on me. And I want to use this as an example to just tell you where I've been and exactly where God has brought me and why I am so passionate about serving, about, about worship through serving. I was the guy that would be on the front row, and as soon as they said, hey, we need this, I would be like, that's me. Check that box. Hey, we need, don't even finish the sentence. I got it. I'll be there. We need people to set up. I did set up and tear down at this church. I served on the worship team. I was at every opportunity, and I just engulfed myself in serving at the church. But here's the thing. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. Is I was not serving to worship God. I was serving to worship the church. I was doing it with the wrong heart. And it took a few years, and I, I eventually burned out, and, and I just, I, I, and it was, again, it was all on me. It was everything to do with me. And we moved here to Virginia, and, and through a series of people that I met, and praying, and really getting into the scriptures. Like I said, I used to think of worship just as music. Like this was a time, you, you get about 20, 30 minutes in, in the beginning of the church service, maybe a little bit after, that's your time to worship. Okay, everything else, that's not worship. No, it, it took me getting into the scriptures. It took me learning about what worship is, about avodah, about worshiping through serving, that it really opened up my heart and opened up my mind. We're going to share communion here in a few minutes. And what I want this time to be is a time that you really can reflect on, on your posture of worship. I, I like using that word, that posture of worship because what it is is it's really like we learned about in some of these Hebrew words some of them are hands extended some of them are hands you know your, your body is physically bowed down on the ground some of these look exuberant some of them look very solemn so whatever your posture of worship is maybe something that I said about praying about giving really resonated in your heart maybe it's the music that really resonated in your heart about worshiping through music. So this is a time that I really want us to just kind of sit back and do some work with God. And we're gonna use communion as an opportunity to not only give thanks for what God has done for us, but for us to really examine our hearts and to allow God to work and speak to us. If you don't have a communion element, Amy's in the back, she has the basket over there. We have one over on this side. You can just raise your hand and just, you know, say, I, 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 need a, I need a communion element, and they'll come and they'll give it to you. Communion is a time in the church. It's a, it's, a, it's a sacrament. It's a very special time that we get to reflect on what God has done for us. We can reflect on what God has done for us. I want to... I want to I want to speak to those that have not asked Jesus into their hearts. Maybe you're here today and, and you would say, Ian, I, I'm not a Christian as I have not asked Jesus into my heart. And I would say this to you. You, listen, you are welcome here. While we are, as Christians, expressing our hearts in the act of communion, this, this is instead of a time for you to Reflect on what God did to you. Maybe this is time for you to ask God into your heart and say, Lord, I want you to show me, whether it's through my spirit, whether it's in a very tangible way, show me what your son did for me. And this is a time of observance for you to be around Christians as we, as we, as we share communion together. 
The worship team is gonna sing a song. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. And whatever your posture of worship while we sing is, if you wanna make an altar right there at your seat, if you wanna just sit and close your eyes, if you wanna kneel down, if you wanna come up here at the front of the altars, then, then you do that. Let this be a time of reflection for you as Mallory and the worship team lead us.